trigger warning. This podcast is about grief. Whether you are newly bereaved or whether you have been stuck in grief for years, I do hope this podcast brings you some comfort. Grief is such a universal experience, but we all do it differently. This podcast is not about fixing you or forcing the healing process because there is no cure for grief. It can only be absorbed, experienced, loved and cared for. So whether you are doing it privately behind closed doors or like me, you are kicking and screaming your way through, let's support each other. This is a safe space where we can come together and share experiences. My hope is that this podcast shines a light on your path and gives you the strength to navigate your way through the grieving process. My name is Louise Bates and I'm so pleased we connected. I'm looking forward to interviewing people who have also walked this path to find out what worked for them in the hope that it helps you too. I'm sending you so much love and support and I look forward to sharing this crazy journey with you. Hello and welcome to this episode of A Gift for Grief and today I'm speaking to someone very close to me. This person is the technical guy behind the scenes in putting this podcast together. He's in control of the sound and quality and he sits in on all my episodes. I just so happen to also be married to him. So welcome Bill Bates and thank you for being a guest. You're welcome. Now, when I first suggested doing these podcasts, you were not fully on board, were you? Would you like to explain why? I wasn't fully on board because you asked me at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sort of I woke I wake up at six o'clock every morning, and you didn't say good morning, hiya, Bill. You went, I've got this fantastic idea. Well, I had been awake since two o'clock. Yeah. Thinking about it, I can't wait for you to wake up to say, oh, Bill, I've got this exciting idea. And then what happened next? Well, then you woke me up and then you went, Bill, I've got this idea about doing a podcast. And at the time I was making two albums for people in the recording studio. I was full on in my in my business and I'd got like, uh, I was just doing so many different things. <laughs> and then you go, oh, let's do a podcast. It was like, no, but... and. These microphones I'm using at the moment, I only had one. I got loads of mics, but this was the one good, really good podcast mic. And I was like, ah, I can't because I've only got the one podcast mic. <laughs> and then I said, yes, but Bill, if I buy you another podcasting mic, would you consider it? Yeah. And then your eyes opened and yeah. you were like, you got all excited about it, yeah, didn't you? I can't you? turn down a mic, can I? And uh, And I have to say... Um, I jumped at the chance in the end and started podcasting before you, I think. You did. You, you started your fairly accurate <laughs> podcast with your mate Roop, didn't you? No, I'd started another podcast before that oh, one. We've gone podcasting mad in this family, haven't we? We have. So you do realise this is like therapy for us, isn't it? Sitting, talking. Yeah, we talk, but I think I uh, I changed the subject quite a lot if you'd start talking about grief. Yeah, I'm a talker and you're not. But this is this is like a session as if, you know, people that go for counselling, for couples counselling, oh, if they're getting yeah. divorced or something. Yeah. We might need to do something like this after this podcast. No, not divorced, no. But <laughs> you like to share, don't you? You like to, you know. I know, I've been known to be a bit of an oversharer. Yeah, and I tend to... You're more private. Yeah, but no, I volunteered in the end, didn't I? You did. So we've done 12 episodes so far, and I'm intrigued to know if you found any of them helpful in your grief journey. Yes, I have. Um, every single one of the people um, you've interviewed are generally brilliant. Yeah. Especially my daughter, Piper. But you know what I mean? Every, no, generally, they were fantastic. And I've took something out of each one. Yeah. For example, um, Charlie Hart, you interviewed her, and I think I, I found out I might be ADHD. Yeah, just saying Charlie Hart is an advocate for neurodiverse um, people. She's a real expert in this subject. But she was brilliant talking yeah. about ADHD. There's uh, one of your guests talked about preparing 
um, sort of documents, either online or not online, to share with those people who you leave behind for your passwords. Oh, end of life planning. Yeah. Yeah, I've started doing that. I've got, um, I've started making, I have I told you this, I've started making a book, so a death book. No, you haven't. Oh, no. Basically, it's a book with those passwords in. And where do you keep this book? Well, I haven't finished it yet. But okay. Yeah, and so all my passwords and stuff for banking and my business stuff, so that if I do pass away, um, you'll know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, can you imagine, right, if, if I die and you die at the same time, how difficult it would be for Piper to deal with. It's a, it's a massive task, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it has made me think about getting my affairs in order it's, because none of us know how long we've got in this life. You know, we don't have to wait for a diagnosis or a prognosis. We could go out tomorrow and get hit by a bus, couldn't we? Well, I don't, you know? we, yeah, I, I'm trying to avoid buses, but yeah, I wouldn't know what your password is. No. I don't know what my password is half the time. <laughs> We've got no chance, have we? And like you, I've taken something from every single guest. Yeah. There's golden nuggets in there. And I think, well, if I'm taking something from these guests, the listeners will also be gaining from listening yeah. as well. But, I will say a but, OK? It has been difficult. OK. Because when I recall people, you're having a conversation with them. Yeah. I'm listening to not only what they say, but how they're saying it. And I'm listening to their voice and I'm listening to the emotion in their voice. And you can hear the emotion when they're talking. And that's really difficult. And I've been, you know, quite um, emotional then, let's say. Yeah. Listening to these people talk. Yeah. It's a difficult topic, but I think people need to hear these conversations because People don't talk about grief and loss. Hmm. And that's fine if that's how people want to be. But I think the more we normalise these conversations and people hear these conversations, there'll be less awkwardness and clumsiness around the topic. Yeah. So, you know, another reason for doing the podcast is to get this message out there. Yeah. So, Bill, for people who don't know you, could you share a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, you see, you're doing the sharing thing again, aren't you? <laughs> They might be interested, you know, we have to keep our listeners interested. Well, I'm 65, I'm married. <laughs> so we we met when um, you were 17 and I was 18. OK, going back. Do, do you want me to go back that oh, we far? Don't, they don't want a life story. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to bore people. <laughs> no, OK, so I'm a guitarist, singer-songwriter, so I do play the guitar still. I haven't done a gig for a while but yeah I do I, you know I'm looking for a gig if anyone wants to to um, give me a gig I'm available the um is that okay I'm not using this as an advertising <laughs> spot it's a bit cheeky that okay the um but no I've I've uh, I'm a what they call an olderpreneur yes I like that yeah so an olderpreneur yeah which if you don't know what that is it's it, I'm a an on an older entrepreneur so it's for people in their 60s who set up a business. Yeah. They're called olderpreneurs. The olderpreneur, I yeah. like that. So I'm one of those. So basically I've sort of um, sort of semi-retired and then I started my own business. But I've also got my recording studio, which we're sitting in at the moment, which a place I love. Uh, and I do voiceovers, I do musicians, um, I do uh, record people making a book, for example, poems, that sort of stuff. And I absolutely love it in here. And, um, yeah. Yeah, so this used to be a garage, didn't it? What happened was you was watching the telly. I was rehearsing, playing my guitar. And you said, Bill, why don't you turn the um, garage into a music room? And it was like, what a fantastic idea. And it went into a, from a music room into a recording studio. And, yeah, I live in here now. You do. It was a good idea of mine, wasn't it? It certainly was a good idea. Yeah. And Matt used to spend many an hour in here, he didn't he? He did. He loved it in here, didn't he? And yeah. he was a great musician. I'm and... sitting opposite you with, over your left-hand shoulder is a picture of Matt playing the guitar. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, many a good hour. So, this is like therapy for you, isn't it? It's the closest you've ever come to therapy, isn't it? It is odd talking about stuff you haven't asked you haven't asked me any like questions at the moment we're shutting oh heck here we go <laughs> um yeah i do 
I'm getting there, generally. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> I try not to talk about grief to you or anybody else. So going to a therapist isn't my natural default, but you should talk about it. My th usual default is this, okay? I get my grief. I put my grief inside a box and then dig a big hole, bury the box, put some cement on top of the box, yeah. okay? Yeah. And then put some really heavy weights on top of the cement. Yeah. And then bury it all and then walk away and not talk about it. And how's and that, that working out for you? Well, it isn't. As, it doesn't. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it's With all difficulty. It's all confidential in here, Bill. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's not going to go outside of this room. So no, can, no, no, no. You can open up now. <laughs> but you like talking to people. Um, you like helping people. You like, you know, you wrote two books about grief. So, you know what I mean? You, you, you've shared our story and you've asked me permission i said yeah not a problem because it generally does help people it's just i find it difficult to talk about my experience yeah yeah i we're, think a lot of blokes are like that if you want to be you know is that sexist i don't know no no um we we both do it very differently i'm i'm an oversharer and you're very private when it comes to grief but you know it is a human universal experience but research suggests that men and women often experience the grieving process differently like I say we both did it very differently I like to talk about my grief and I like to talk about deep and meaningful topics and I appreciate that I can be a bit intense sometimes really but did you notice? <laughs> <laughs> but you like to grieve very quietly and privately so what are your thoughts on how differently we both navigated our way through? Do you think there is a difference to how men and women grieve? I think we both navigated our grief very differently. I tended to go to work, leaving the house, trying to desperately maintain normality, both when Matthew was ill and also after he um, died, I tried to stay in a sort of place where it was normal. And it was very difficult to people at work because they saw me upset and, you know, but they tried to carry on. They were brilliant, actually. I'm not sure if I ever told them how good they were, but they were brilliant. Um, but, yeah, I was just desperate to stay in a sort of place where just to cling on to some normality and you, you know, you you sat with Matt day after day after day while he was um, really seriously ill. And you got so close to him, didn't you? So close to him. And so I think that we both shared different experiences. Did I run away? I'm not sure if I run away. I'm sometimes a bit hard on myself, to be honest, because I think I should have been here more to help you but can i just say i think you are being a bit hard on yourself because you are the you always have been the main breadwinner you know bills needed to be paid we were spending a lot of money on we stuff spent, my we business spent thousands thousands of pounds on stuff my business basically went down the toilet because i was just needing to be with matt so only one of us was earning so it's a case of you needed to go to work. And when you were here, you did everything. You you know, you might even wrote you a letter saying what a great dad you were. And yeah, you put a lot of that. stuff in there that you can take, you know. But you still beat yourself up about the fact that you went to work. Yeah. But in all families, when there's long-term illnesses, you know, life still has to go on. You can't yeah. just stop doing what you're doing. My, my boss, my old boss, Charlie Bend, he, my sort of, he was the MD, 
he was fantastic. He was he, amazing. He, he would have let me stay at home as much as I wanted, to be honest. He was that good. And not everybody's got that sort of support. Um, but it was easier to get to work. I'm telling you now, it was easier. You yeah. Know, I, I thought it might have been like a coward's way out. No, so you've got but to stop using just, that sort of language yeah, because you it, it wasn't like that at all. No, no. Um, Perhaps I ought to get some counselling. It might be a good idea. <laughs> you know you're married to a therapist, don't you? <laughs> but no, I think men and women do... T I know I'm generalising, but um, I think that conditioning and gender roles have been ingrained for such a long time. Well, you've got the man up thing, haven't you? Yeah. You know, like, you've got big a man up. Big boys don't cry. Big boys don't cry. Yeah, yeah. don't be like a girl. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All of these things. It's it, And it's all come from, you know societal conditioning you know men feel more pressured to adopt a more stoic behavior stoic's a good word yeah and you know they suppress their feelings but men may feel more inclined to isolate themselves or engage in activities that distract them from their pain well if you think um, about um, talking about men um, and i'm not sure if i'm comfortable with it a segregated men and women in grief i'm not sure but Generally, Ge well, yeah. Generally, like in mental health, for example, three times more men die by suicide than women. Yeah. So there is a difference, you know. Yeah. The, yeah. Um. But the the point is, is that you do need somebody to talk to. I had somebody to talk to. My mate came here, and he knows who he is. I don't have to say who he is, but he would come in here to do some recording with me, and then we'd spend most of the time talking about stuff yeah. and then he'd go and he'd probably only sing a verse and a chorus and he'd yeah. gone you know what I mean but that I, I had somebody to talk to yeah obviously I had you obviously but I had a mate to talk to and which was brilliant you need somebody to talk to absolutely I think having a grief buddy is really important you know somebody that can listen someone who can listen and without judgment yeah um you know if you haven't got a grief buddy then seek out a counselor speak to your doctor not everybody is a good listener aren't they in fact it happened to me this week when um you did a talk um and and they said oh what's your wife talking about and because oh we, we we lost our son to cancer and uh and the and he went straight away he went oh i lost i lost my nan to cancer it was awkward yeah. So you think, well, wh wh where does the conversation go from here? It's People say really um, awkward things when um, they're in that position. They just want to connect with you in some way. So they're trying to think of something, a shared experience. So you lost your son to cancer. Oh, I lost my nan to cancer. There's some sort of, you know, um, said, similarity there. Was that... it to you, to me, that he said, oh, I lost my dog? No, when somebody said, oh, what type of cancer did they have? I said, oh, Matt, my son had um, a very rare and aggressive form of kidney cancer. They said, oh, my cat had that. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And that shut the conversation down, <laughs> basically. But again, that person was just wanting to connect with me on some level. So I think it's really important to sort of read the intention yeah, okay. behind people's words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's hard for people to know what to say. True enough. Um, but going back to the men and women thing, there's definitely um, differences. Because, you know, if you saw me in a pub crying with some friends, and then in, in another corner you saw a lad crying with his friends, that would look more weird than a woman crying, wouldn't it? Yes. Because I think women are generally encouraged to be more openly emotional and seek support. And women are more likely to share their feelings with friends and family members or seek therapy or counselling. And it's a known fact that women are more likely to attend support groups. So I think there yeah, is, okay. you know, um, a difference between how we do it. When it not, obviously, not it's not for everybody, but generally speaking, um, women... It's people feel more comfortable that with women being emotional than men being emotional. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's time to change this. Men cry too. And it's okay. And we need to normalise these conversations. Yeah, that's true enough. So yeah, I, you know, it's really great that you're you're talking and sharing your 
experience today because I'm sure there will be lots of men out there that will be able to resonate with how you deal with your grief how you bury your grief I'm not recommending it's you know the way to do it whatever but I'm works not, for you yeah good, you can't judge other people on how other people do their grief so did you feel pressure to put on a brave face no I wouldn't say that no not pressure at all um because I wanted normality I tried to keep smiling and I'm a naturally smiley person. So people thought, you know, he's doing all right. Bill's doing even now, you know, I'll go around smiling. If you see somebody smiling, don't presume that they're happy. <laughs> like, no. Like, like, you don't know what's going on. You know, you don't know what problems they've got. Because you don't want to go around really, you know, telling them, you don't want to be boring telling everybody how sad you are and oh my son's the idea so you've you've got to keep going haven't you well i do remember when matthew died you went into organizing lol i was a complete mess and you were amazing you immediately took on the role of informing people making sure everyone else was okay you were sorting out all the legal stuff and you threw yourself into being busy and that was a blessing but looking back now do you think it was also a distraction it was a distraction, but I didn't do it to make it a distraction. Um, it needed doing. Yeah. You know, when somebody dies, you, I wanted to tell family, myself. Um, I wanted to tell close friends, myself. I wanted to tell Matthew's close friends, myself. I didn't want them to hear it from other people. Um, we knew it was going to happen, so we knew who to contact and in what order. You know, you could tell your yeah that was closest to you first um and one thing is i am an organized person and i was organized yeah you know the and it was easier to do that than you know fall to bits yeah i was um and even since that day i've continued to have a be an organized person and not fall to bits. Even when I'm falling to bits, I'm still organised. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I think it's the ADHD kicking in. <laughs> so what helps you navigate your way through the grief journey? Oh, I navigated my grief journey really badly. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a good way? I don't think there are. These questions are getting really hard. Okay. Uh, how did I navigate? Okay, um, I'll explain. I'll tell you what helped me. And there's a, somebody called G Snow who uh, was on Reddit and he wrote a poem called, oh, I can't remember what it was called. You'll remember I know what, what you're going to say. Is, is it grief like, grief is like a shipwreck? Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, what he talked about was grief is being like a tsunami. So when somebody dies, it's like this massive, giant tsunami hitting you and it's just you, you think you're going to drown and it's and it, it just destroys everything in its path the tsunami uh, but then you survive and then later maybe a short while later this another tsunami comes along and hits you again and bashes you around and throws you around like a tumble dryer and but you survive and over a period of time eventually these tsunami waves start getting smaller and there's maybe more time between each one and every now and again another big one comes along like yesterday it hits you yeah and but eventually you start realizing that even though the waves are big one you're going to survive yeah and he wrote that and it was like a poem and it was brilliant. It's genius. And and I'll, yeah, I, did, I actually wrote to him because you put it in your book, didn't you? I did put it in my book and I needed to get permission from the author so, yeah. and you found and him and yeah. he gave me permission to put it in the book. So yeah. it's called um, Grief is Like a Shipwreck by um, G. Snow. G. Snow. And it really helped me as well. And I think, well, it really helped us. We need to share that so it will hopefully help other people yeah. as well. There was other stuff 
you know, there was the one about the twins, the twins, the twins parable. parable. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And there's lots of other stuff in there. And research, you know, because your book, Letters to Matthew, um, oh, that was difficult at the start. I tell you, when you told me you was going to write a book, so I knew you, you know, you were writing stuff down. Uh, and then you said you wanted to share your book. It was like, what are you sharing everything? It was like, yeah. It's like, wow. And then we was, um, I was helping you like collate it then. Yeah, well, I couldn't have done it without you. I, I just did the writing and you did all, you got the permissions from different people that I needed to get permissions for to put information in the book. And I know I'm, I am an oversharer, but I didn't put everything in the book. No, and certain, didn't. obviously I do keep some things yeah. back. Oh, so man, you imagine didn't. you think I've overshared that. Imagine what else is happen yeah. that isn't in the but book. But you don't know, there's stuff that people go through and you don't know what other people are going through. And, you know, grief really knocks you. And it's good having somebody to share this grief with. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so important. And not everybody has got somebody and we've got each other. And in a way, it was a blessing and a curse because it was a blessing that we were together and we could help each other. But in a way, we couldn't help each other because we both did it differently. If I wanted to talk and you didn't, you know, it was difficult for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, but you know we got through that, yeah. and you know um, here we are now talking about it oh. on a podcast. <laughs> 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 but hey, doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> this is normal, isn't it? it in helps. our world, I know it helps. I know it'll help people. Yeah. Believe me, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think it did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you remember what it was like when Matthew first died? Because I had some awkwardness around different people and people crossing the road and that, that type of thing to avoid me. I don't, I'm not sure if you had the same no, experience. I, I Did you didn't. find people were okay with you? I, I was amazed how amazed, I was amazed how amazing people were. People at work, like I said before, were fantastic. My boss was fantastic. Yeah. Just so, friends were fantastic. So no, I, I didn't have that experience of people crossing the road i didn't have all that yeah. i mean we we're both lucky we've, we've got amazing family and friends yeah. that supported us and again not everybody has that so bill what words would you choose to express your condolences to someone wow it's really difficult isn't it because I, my natural default is sorry for your loss yeah that's like a catch-all isn't it phrase yeah and i'm if I say I'm sorry for your loss, I would mean I'm sorry for your yeah. loss. You know what I mean? So uh, I know it's not enough, but I'm no good with words as it is. You know what I mean? I, I find it really difficult. I find it really difficult to talk to you now on a podcast. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you're not going to get anything like Shakespearean from me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and why is not? <laughs> There isn't a good way of saying, I'm sorry, somebody has died. It's a, there no. is not a good way of saying it, mate. Yeah. No. Okay. Can you recommend any books, films, podcasts or groups to support people? But but don't mention my books. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, every time when, when you start talking about a book. Yeah. About grief, right? I think about Richard Dawkins' book. The God Delusion. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. And I know you know about this because you actually put it in your book. The I was watching, I think it was either um, a TV programme or a documentary or something on telly. And it was Richard Dawkins talking about his book, The God Delusion. And in it, he was saying there is no God and you know that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I'm sitting there nodding, saying, uh, yeah, you're right, Richard. Yeah, there is no God. And uh, anybody who thinks there is a God is, you know, wasting their time, that sort of stuff. Okay. And then um, I'm sitting there agreeing with him. And then later on in the day, I find out my son got cancer the same day. Right. And I thought, is it because I've agreed with Richard Dawkins? Yeah. You know okay. what I mean? Is it, you know, is it like, is this God's punishing me? 
you know, giving my son cancer because I, I refused to believe in him. And I actually thought that. I remember. Oh, I remember you talking. It, it. it really up. upset you, the fact that you had agreed with Richard Dawkins. Yeah. So if you're going to ask me to recommend a book, I'm not recommending his. OK. So you never know what's going to happen. Don't buy his book. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. But was there a book to help you go through grief? There's a lot of books, good books out there. There's a lot of good books. But you yeah. haven't read any of them. I, I <laughs> couldn't, no. So what words of wisdom, Bill, can you share to help someone loosen their grief in some way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm this worried about the answer to it. I'm not sure if I should have asked really you this more, question. It's more and more difficult. Coming, you know, Speaking to somebody that says the most inappropriate things sometimes, what's Bill going to say? I developed a very dark sense of humour when we lost Matt. And I am the least authorised person to ask for advice on what to say when somebody dies. I'll tell you what I did the other day, OK? Go on. We was at a funeral for somebody up north. Yeah. And... I said to somebody, I... I remember you said something very inappropriate all in I, the graveyard. All I said was, um, it's not a lot of point you going home, is that right? I saw it was a joke. To somebody a little bit older than yourself. He's a lot older than me. That's cool. <laughs> he actually thought it was funny. Yeah. But I say inappropriate things. Don't ask me what's the best thing to say. Because I'd get it all wrong. Yeah, yeah. We won't put that one but in the what, podcast. What would, we'll edit that one out. <laughs> no, but what would you say then? Well, you know, I'll turn the question around on you. What would you do? Well, a lot of the time it depends who it is and where you are. But I would say I'm really sorry that your whatever the person's name is died. I'm here anytime you want to talk. Bake him a cake. You, you know what my baking's like. <laughs> I wouldn't put that on anybody. <laughs> What's the next question? I didn't like that question. So where are you on your grief journey now? Right, I've left the motorway, OK? Right. And I've gone up a side road and I'm on a, a, one of those roads where it goes uh, not suitable for vehicles. Have you been following your sat-nav again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm yeah. doing okay. Yeah, I have good days. Look, mostly good days. Yeah. What happens is, if, I don't know if anyone listened to this who's um, have lost somebody, and they'll know this. Like you're happy. Like today, I was in a good mood today, and I was doing stuff at work in my computer, and then for some reason, I I went on to images and I saw a picture of Matt, and I was in tears. Yeah. Oh, no, it was a Facebook thing come up, a Facebook memory, OK? So you write one minute and then wham. Yeah. OK? And you was out of the room and, and I, you know, I got a little bit welled up. And then next minute, it was like you come down and you was like, you're right. He was like, what happened? <laughs> you know, I left you, I left you happy one minute and come back down and you were upset. And it's just one of those things. Yeah. That's what happens, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's seven years now um, since Matthew died. And we do have a lovely life now, but we still have the waves and the occasional tsunamis. And for me, it was a few weeks ago when a Facebook memory popped up. And it's popped up for the last six years. Same memory, yeah. Same memory. And for the last six <clears throat> years, I've just looked at it and thought, oh, that was nice, and, and reminisced and thought about how lovely it was. This year it popped up, and wow. I was a complete wreck. Yeah. And it wiped me out for the rest of the day. It's it's You just never know when never something's going to come along and hit you. And, and that's where we are in our grief journey, isn't it? Yeah. Um, having a lovely life. But still, but, do you know, I don't mind, though. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I don't mind this f thing happening. No, I don't. Because it just, rem you know, I remember. Oh, I'm not even doing that now. I get too upset. Oh, <laughs> we've got plenty of time, Bill. 
<laughs> What's your next question? You oh, sure God. you want to skip that one? <laughs> Okay, so my next question is, do you believe that grief has given you any gifts? Yeah. Yeah, I do, actually. Strangely, surprisingly. Would you like to share? Yeah, um, a mate told me this. Somebody had lost his son in, in Afghanistan, as it happened. And I admired his son very much, and I admired his dad very much. And his dad, we just had a little brief chat about it and he said uh, he said the only thing it's taught him is that it's giving this sort of superpower where you can do whatever you want and you can't hurt me he's give you this shield nothing can hurt you anymore no matter what people do no matter what people say they can't hurt you yeah which is give you this sort of superpower, superpower you don't want, you know. Um, so, I, you know, like I've been had a few stressful things happen to me, um, maybe work-related, that sort of stuff, pales into insignificance to what's happened. So, uh, yeah, that's a... Is it, is it a... It's not a good thing to have, but... I'll take it. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. I'm a lot calmer. Like when I'm driving, I'm, somebody cuts me up. Doesn't mean anything anymore. Matt taught me that. He, he was... Um, he, I remember him saying that um, when... He, he, he said about things that were important to him. Yeah. And, like, I don't care if somebody cuts me up anymore now. Where before, you know, I'd try and get them at the next traffic lights. No, nah, I'm not bothered. It's, I'm a far more relaxed person now. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm more aware that I don't know what's going on in their life. That person who might have cut me up might be trying to get to his grandma who's dying or something like that. You know what I mean? We don't know. Yeah. What would you like people to learn from your experience? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that people should look after themselves, physically, mentally, and look after their friends. Okay. But I, I'm not the right person to ask, really, to be pun. I wouldn't take advice off me for that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, true, actually. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the afterlife? Here we go. Oh, crikey. We might disagree on this one. Well, the thing is, what I'm, I'm intrigued to know what you're going to put on the record because whenever we have these deep and meaningful conversations, you have a different theory every time. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, OK, so we'll, we'll start from a positive side, OK? So sometimes I'm in here recording and I think Matt's with me. So and that's, that's nice, That's isn't nice, it? isn't it? Yeah. And what makes you think that? Just this feeling I get. Okay. Okay. Other times, I think there's nothing in the afterlife. Zero. It's just, you know, it's just we're here. We are people who've just developed over a period of time and there's nothing. Once you're dead, you're dead. Okay. I often think that as well. But I will tell you, and I know this for sure, we won't know until we're dead. That's very deep and meaningful. Yeah, I though. know. So, like, if you want to believe in a God, no matter what God, as long as you don't go around killing people on behalf of your God, I'm, I'm happy for you to believe in your God. And I'm also happy for those people who don't believe in God. And we might be right or we might be wrong but yeah. as long as we're nice to each other you know what i mean that's the main thing yeah it's what you do here because some people believe in god and they're still horrible and some people don't believe in god and they're lovely yeah yeah so i don't know i don't know okay. seriously that's fine it's a good answer i might change my mind you tomorrow. don't have to know do you believe our loved ones can give us signs oh lou i used to believe in Feathers. I don't know if you remember this, right? I used to believe in feathers. So 
I used to look when Matt was mm. ill, I used to look out for feathers. OK. And. I used to love it when I saw a white feather. And I used to pick them up. I've actually got one in this room. Yeah. You know? And it's, and I still find them every now and again. But there was one day when Matt was very, very, very ill. I found this feather and it was, it had stopped in midair. I kid you not. It was like suspended animation. This feather, big okay. feather. Not white, not black. And I looked at this feather and I thought, what is going on? It was weird, Lou. It was like this thing had stopped, time had stopped. And what happened? The feather had fallen and landed on a cobweb. Ah. Uh-huh. So it looked like it was in midair. And I used to look out for white feathers and he still died. So it's nice. It's nice to see feathers, but they don't actually mean anything. What did mean something at the time was a good friend of mine gave me two little rocks, two little stones. And with words written on them, hope. And I can't remember the last second word. Faith. Faith. I think it was faith. And I used to carry these stones everywhere and they made so much to me. I actually gave them to somebody because they needed them more than me in the end. Yeah. But two little rocks. Yeah. I mean, it was like rocks. I'm carrying rocks around. A grown man. But you can understand it because people want to hold on to something, don't they? People was... need something. Um, some hope. I think maybe it wasn't that. Yeah, because hope had been taken away. We was told not to hope. So... Um... It was a lovely thing to do, though, wasn't it? Give yeah. somebody these. Yeah. But um, you haven't really answered the question whether you believe loved ones can give us signs. No. Well, I've in here, I felt that many times. Yeah. So was that a sign? Maybe. I, I don't know. Okay. I'll be honest with you. Because I don't want to say no. No. Okay. But I don't want to say yes either. So if you could give Matthew a message now, what would you say? Oh, I've heard you ask this question to your guests. And I thought, I hope she doesn't ask me that question. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) You don't get away with it that easily. (laughs) Okay, I'll be honest. I would say sorry. You'd say sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, God, you... I'm going to have a glass of wine. Um, I said I'm going to say sorry because I wasn't here enough for him. I know you don't agree. Even though he wrote you a letter saying what an amazing dad you were, thanking you for everything. I'm going to edit this bit out, you know that, don't you? (laughs) (laughs) I don't have any control over the editing. (laughs) You asked me, I told you the answer. But yeah. Okay. Would you like to say anything else? To Matt? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd tell him I'd love him, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And on that note, I'll put you out of your misery. Thank goodness for that. And um, <laughs> you can go and finish that bottle of wine now. <laughs> Shall I go and put the kettle on? Yes, please. <laughs> when it comes to grieving, men tend to exhibit different coping mechanisms compared to women. Society expects us to be emotionally strong which just leads us to suppressing our emotions. The phrase, big boys don't cry, is just a harmful stereotype. It suggests that we need to appear strong and it just undermines our mental well-being. Bottling up your feelings or burying emotions can lead to all sorts of anxiety or depression and it can even affect your physical health. It's important that we give ourselves the space and time to feel what we need to feel. Feeling is healing. If you feel like crying, just cry. It doesn't make you any less of a man. It's important to talk about your feelings. Maybe talk to a friend or somebody in your family or even a therapist. 
Just don't bottle it up. And don't bury it. It doesn't work. I know that because I tried it. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Gift for Grief. Please feel free to share it with your friends and family and let's encourage others to become more grief literate. If you're struggling with your grief or worried about your mental health, please do speak to your doctor. If you would like to join me on my social media groups, check out the show notes for all the links and I look forward to connecting with you next time. The music on this podcast was written and recorded by Matthew Bates and can be found on his two albums, Fight Back and Kaleidoscope.